The story of Rajput in medieval India occupies a large space. Unfortunately, a lot of these accounts are about myths and legends which have very little historical bearing. But these have to be taken into account because a large debate has also concentrated around the origin of the Rajputs and their particular role in resisting the Delhi Sultans and the Muslim rulers of the period. Now, I will begin first with their origin myth, which is known as the Ognikulo myth. Uh, it is said that the Brahmins in this period, that is around uh, 10th century, realized that the social structure was breaking down, which depended very much on the four castes carrying on their activities. Now there was a gap, and in that gap of the warrior caste, that is where the Rajputs were inducted in. The story goes that the Brahmins started a fire on the top of Mount Abu, and out of the sacrificial fire, about four armed men just jumped out, and they were the actual originators of the four Rajput clans. Now this Ognikula myth has been quoted over and over again in historical debates, but it has remained, according to some historians, a story of legitimization. The caste system in which the Rajputs were included were definitely different from the other castes in that period. What we find is that it was caught up very much within their clan system. The clan system was again divided according to the territorial units of the villages. This was also divided by the numerical rate of 12. So sometimes the smallest unit of the Rajputs would be composed of 48 villages and the largest unit would be 84 and above. Now, this entire area was divided between the Rajputs and the non-Rajputs. So what happened was that caste and clan came together, but it communally then divided the Rajputs from other people of that area. The two factors which had become most important in keeping the Rajputs together were their, supposed to be their common origin. All the Rajputs claimed descent from either a solar or a lunar power or dynasty of the epic period. There were the foreigners, the Hooners, who lived in this area, who were incorporated into the Rajput clans, and initially they used to be known as the Gurjaras, the Gurjara Pratiharas or the Huna Gurjaras. But actually, after a while, they came to be known only by one name, and that was the Pratiharas. But apart from the Hoons, there were also the tribal people, the, the Bheels, the Medas, who were also incorporated into this clan. Now, this entire legitimizing principle uh, occurred according to the logic and the demands of the Brahmins. So the caste system played a very important part in this. And that is why later historians have started debating the actual authenticity, not only the authenticity, but also the importance of trying to read these myths. Now, it was in the ruins of the Gurjara Pratihara Empire that the Rajput states came into existence. The three most important were the Gaharwars, the Paramaras, and the Chauhans. The Chauhans were from Ajmer. There was not necessarily a common enemy which they were fighting. Often they were fighting among themselves. But one of the most important wars which the Chauhans in the later period fought was that with the Muslim sultans who were coming in. The two battles of Tarai by Prithiraj Chauhan 
the fir in the first battle of Tarai, he defeated the Muslims. And in the second battle of Tarai, he was unfortunately defeated himself and became a vassal of the Muslim sultans. We must remember that this was not a straight fight between the Hindus and the Muslims as has been construed by some historians. It was in the later period when the sultans came into power that we find that some of the Rajput states were marked out as the areas where the conflict was concentrated. One of this in the 15th century was Mewar. Earlier, you see, there was the first dynasty which were known as the uh, Guhils. They were becoming very important in the area by conquering the other states. But then they came into conflict with the sultans and Alauddin Khilji occupied Chitor and the Guhilas lost to him. After that, the Sasodias came into power. And among the Sisodia rulers, there was well, the man who was also very well known was Rana Kumbho. But his war was mainly against that of Malwa and the surrounding territories. Now, during this period, we find that there was a definite cultural exchange between this entire area. During the period of Rana Kumbho, an attempt was also made to bring about the solidarity of the Rajputs. But unfortunately, this could not be achieved. And later, after him, that is his grandson, Rana Sangha, also tried to bring about a confederacy of the Rajputs to fight the Lodis. And it was thus that he invited Babur to come and help him. But what resulted was that Babur not only defeated the sultans, but also started a war against the Rajputs. And ultimately, he was able to conquer them. With the military achievements of the Rajputs, Coming to a particular point, we find how the warrior caste was actually defining itself. Now, if you take Prithiraj Johan, then we find that he was leading an army of 300,000, which included the cavalry and about 300 elephants. Now, all this was in terms of force built mainly with Rajput armed men and also they had some of the non-Rajput men who were of the lower caste. Now, from the beginning, no such feeling existed between the enemies and the other powers who were fighting with him or without him. So what we find is that the Rajputs formed a kind of a unit of their own. And later, often, there was interpersonal struggle between these various units. So the fight was going on not only between Rajputs and non-Rajputs, but it was also going on between the Rajputs themselves through the different clans. After Prithira Chauhan was defeated, and the Chohans were moved from Ranthambar. Uh, they, they came to settle in Ajmer. Ranthambar was also occupied by Alauddin Khilji. So by the 15th century, when the Rajputs had almost distributed into various small units, and uh, the Delhi sultans had established their power not only in North India, but also parts of the other parts of the country, and they were steadily moving in to Rajasthan. We find Mewar was one of the states which was coming into prominence. And even while Rana Sangha, in trying to defeat Lodis, uh, were bringing, inviting Babur and trying to get all the Rajputs together, what happened was very clearly that he was himself not able to hold his either his military power or his territories in good order. And finally, when Babur came in, 
the wars that started brought in a decline of the military achievements of the Mewar. Now, during this period, what we have to notice is that even in Mewar, certain military technology was being developed, which they had also acquired from the sultans. Apart from that, they were using other kinds of uh, devices to build their forts, which were becoming very, very powerful and impregnable. Uh, the third factor is also that the Rajputs, in spite of everything, were being brought under a common religious uh, fervor that was the Bhakti movement. The story of Mirabai of Mewar, who was one of the greatest women uh, Bhaktins of our period, actually created that aura of religious fervor which brought in chivalry, honor, everything under one banner. And the Rajputs, who were actually considered to be the protectors of the Hindu religion and protectors of women and the concept of chivalry was actually took its height in this period. But this was expressed more through literature, literature of the kind that was written by Chandbar Dai to right up to the Sufi poets like Malik Muhammad Jaisi. It was also found in the songs and music which filtrated down to the common people. Overall, there was the story of give and take between the ruling class and the common people. How much of that was actually a reality, we do not know. But the Bhakti movement and the Mira legend definitely gives us a new insight into Rajput history, which needs to be explored. The other thing is that the, the myth that not only the Rajputs, but all the Hindu rulers had actually together resisted the Muslims right from the 12th century to the 15th century was completely made clear that this was not so. That the Hindus or the Rajputs fought among themselves just as much as they made alliances with the other Muslim powers in this area at that time, that is Gujarat and that is parts of the Deccan. So what we have to keep in mind is that while a feeling of consolidation and an identity was also coming into force, that is the Rajputs were thinking of themselves as Rajputs, they were also thinking of themselves as members of a ruling class who in order to remain in government must ally with any of the ruling class who would help them. And this is where you see the concept of feudalism actually was at play in a way which alienated them from their own community and led to the collapse of the Rajput power. The Rajput rulers were also patrons of great art and art architectural activity. And Rana Kumbhu had a huge tower built in order to commemorate his victories. It still stands in Rajasthan. Now, around this, that is around the temples and around the palaces and uh, minars, we now find a definite inflorescence of art and architectural activity which is connected with the Rajputs. It began with Khajuraho where uh, the Chandelos of Khajuraho built a very important uh, complex of temples. The Khandari of Mahadeo, the Koilashna temple, the later additions all followed that of the Nagaru school. That is a long shikoro or the horizontal lined the head of the temple along with a kind of development like st smaller structures of the Bhogamandapas and the Natmandapas. It sort of formed into a big cluster of 
architectural formation which was never boring and it was broken in terms of space and its uh, ornamentation. So, the Rajasthani architecture took off from the North Indian architecture and from the 12th, 13th century in, in and around Rajasthan developed certain regional characteristics which still stands today and stands as testimony to the art loving public that actually were its patrons. What was happening was quite clear that during the period of Alauddin Khilji, who invaded Chitor and defeated uh, the rulers and occupied it for a while, it was then once again given back to another of the dynasties and the rules were continuing. What we have to remember about the state formation of the Rajputs is that uh, they were based totally on clan loyalty and each of the clans were you know related even the lowest subject was related to the king through kinship and ties of blood this actually built what was the cementing factor in their relations with each other and this was known as rajput loyalty much has been written by historians and social anthropologists on what they considered to be the particular characteristics or moral ethics that were there in the case of the Rajputs when they formulated their relationship with each other. One of this was known as Bhai Bant, which is the tie that I will serve you to the last and that is because they considered the Rana or the leader to be also their king. Now, one of the important things that we have to remember is that based on this, Didi Kosambi formulated a very interesting theory about of feudalism, which is feudalism from above and feudalism from below. He stated that initially, when the Rajput states were being formed, they were being looked at from the point of view of the ruling class that is from the top and this was like a kind of a triangle and the ruler as in feudal Europe was to be the head of the feudal system while the peasantry were to be at the bottom and the, in, the feudatories were to be the other arm who were actually going to take the uh, revenue. But what happened later on in the, particularly in the case of the Rajputs, we saw that there was a division within the subject population themselves. One set were those who were non-Rajputs and the other who were the Rajputs and the Rajputs paid their allegiance to their clan leader first before they would accept any kind of other relationship with, their, uh, with the rulers or with anybody who was their overlord. Now, there has been a lot of debate regarding feudalism in India, but Didi Kosambi's contribution has been considered as very important because it's made specific certain features in the Indian feudalism which is not to be found elsewhere, particularly in the context of European feudalism when we uh, compare India with the world. Now, regarding the Rajputs and their military achievements, you see, war was treated as a sport and every time it was seen that often the Dasera festival was celebrated, then the chief would set out on an expedition of conquering the next country. So, actually, you know, the Chauhans fought the Paramaras, the Paramaras fought the Gaharwals and this kind of thing went on. And the Rajputs were actually caught up in various struggles among themselves and sometimes they even ally, allied with the Muslim Sultans to fight their Rajput brethren. Now, this kind of relationship was to be found also in every kind of feudal setup, 
where the peasantry was to be harnessed to this entire structure of expansion in order to extract more and more revenue. In the context of the Rajputs, there was a specific case because they were giving their tribute not only to a ruler but to their clan chief and also to their tribal head. And this created a specific cultural system with which the Rajputs continue for a long time. The most important part about the Rajputs were that they continued to be considered as the warrior caste even after the Muslim sultans had settled down, the Rajput rulers had formed smaller principalities and even after Babur had come in and had a war with the Rajputs. What we find is that these smaller kingdoms then became centers of what was known as a kind of Rajput culture. And they carried on this feudal burden of chivalry, honor, and resistance, not only against the Muslim sultans, but against each other. And after the 15th century, we see that Rajput solidarity had completely collapsed. The two major rulers, who had played very important part in bringing these together, bringing the Rajputs together. One was Rana Kumbho, both by his conquest and by his policy of patronage and uh, developing a kind of Rajput ethics, and Rana Sangha, who unfortunately later invited Babur because he thought that Babur would be able to throw off the Delhi Sultans, the Lodis. Now, the question that rises is that during these first phase, when the Rajputs were fighting against the Muslim sultans and the invaders, there was not a single ethic that was at play. What there was was military technology. There was a swift cavalry that was being used by the Muslim sultans. It is said that the Rajputs also knew the use of the stirrup and the horses, but somehow their cavalry did not move as fast. The second was the question of the weapons. There was bow and arrow, but at the same time, there were probably introduction of firearms, which actually became very clear from the period of Babur, but artillery was probably being used by the sultans for a long time. Now, this whole thing of war, technology, and a particular culture is, is also tied up with a different kind of a religious and literary movement that was growing in this period, in this entire region. First, we have uh, the mix of kind of Indo-Persian, Indo-Islamic, uh, and Sufistic learning in writings like people like Malik Muhammad Jaisi, who wrote his Padmavat in actually in Hindi. The other is a kind of a belief in the Bhakti literature. During this period, the Sufis and the Bhaktis came, people came together and they, they believed in one God and they believed in a religious, one religious cult. Those who were like uh, believed in Ram or Krishna, also believed in the cult heads, even if they did not believe in one God, they believed in the leader of the cult and the relationship with, the, with God was that to be the lover and the beloved. Now this entire influence was also to be felt in Rajasthan. And here we have on one hand, the stories of Kumbho, uh, being the victor, the conqueror, the ruler, the administrator. On the other, we have the stories of Mirabai and her bhajans, which actually uh, were, held the people together. The temples which were being built during this time, from the period of uh, the Chandelos of Khajuraho, a particular type of sculpture and architecture had become popular in Rajasthan, which developed around the growth of the temples. 
and this was carried on right till the end of the 15th century when we have Rana Kumbho building his Victory Tower. The whole story of Rajasthan is therefore not only that of a group of people who were warriors, who were fighting the Muslims and resisting them. We have an entire story of literature, culture, religious faith, temple building, and again, a social structure which depended very much on its own brand of feudalism. This was also probably the reason why after a period, the Rajputs could no longer sustain their power because they could not come together, they could not be under one solidarity, and unfortunately, the Mughals brought in the centralizing forces which worked right into and walked right into the Rajput social structure and helped to make it their own.